in the eastern Nigeria, there is something we call Ototo. I know that there is a name for it in Yoruba. I don't know, what do you tell children to scare them when they don't want to do something? Yeah, I remember now. I was thinking about what I can't remember. He said that the Ototo will come and so they will run out quickly and go and do it. So in, in the east, we say Ototo, and they quickly you know, go and do it. I used to think it was just like a myth, but this is actually a pagan belief and is dated back to thousands of years before Jesus was born. It is a, 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 a demon or a monster that is believed to scare children and punish the bad children. It is also a demon that is believed to reward good children and give them good gifts. Having that um, introduction in mind, put it aside, I will come back to it. Now, the days of the week, as we know today, as we know today, in the Bible, when we read through the, uh, excuse me, I don't, I don't need that. When we read through the Bible, we will discover that the days of the week, as we know today, it's not how it has been. If we flip from Genesis, you know, through the history, we will notice that the Bible will say, on the first day of the second year of King this, on the third day of this, and how the Israelites and other nations were naming the days were the first to the seventh day that, you know, characterized the week, and then the 30 days that characterized the month. There was nothing like on Tuesday. All these in these new versions of the Bible came after the amalgamation of Christianity with paganism. So, 300 years after Jesus was born, Christianity merged with paganism. And amidst several gods, that we are worshipped in the pagan world, they had seven strong gods that they could not part with. Many of us know these gods. We have the sun god, we have moon, we have two, we have when, we have thirst, we have fry, and we have Saturn. So in order to immortalize these gods and make sure that every nation under the world remember this god, even if it is in ignorance, they had to change the way that we now name the days of the week from the first day of the week to the seventh day of the week. They had to name them according to the seven powerful gods of paganism. Now, a lot of things happened during this amalgamation of Christianity with paganism. Actually, the, it was not only an amalgamation. Paganism almost swallowed up Christianity because most of the things that Christians were known with were changed. A lot of changes took place around the 300 AD, between 300 AD and 400 AD. It was Emperor Arnelos that, he, that started this change when he started to stop the persecution of Christians. Then when Emperor Constantine came into reign, he not just only stopped the persecution of Christians, he made it a law that everybody at that era must be a Christian. There were so few Christians and there were so many pagans. So in order for this law to be widely accepted because he was a very good democrat and politician, he wanted to do something that would favor everybody and everybody would share him as a very powerful ruler. And so, some changes were made. Every day, every first day of the week, the pagans always worship the sun god. So, first he started with that and said, let us move the worship of God on Saturday to Sunday. Now, remember that at that time it was no long, it was not yet Saturday. It was still the seventh day. So let us move it from uh, the worship of God from the seventh day to the first day. Every pagan wakes up and goes to worship the sun god on Sunday. So since we are already used to it and I, Emperor Constantine, also go to worship this sun god, I'm used to doing this every first day of the week. 
Instead of going to worship the sun god, let us go and worship Jesus on that day. Making us to have to go to church on the same day will disorganize our schedules because we have already made the schedules of how we carry days of the week. And so this was widely accepted. But it was a few that said, no, this is not really it. And one of those few was St. Nicholas. I'll come back to St. Nicholas. During this amalgamation, a lot of changes were made. There was the worship of the Queen of Heaven. This Queen of Heaven, because they couldn't just drop this worship, they changed the worship of the Queen of Heaven to the worship of Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. Now, pagans were used to bowing down to idols. You can't just remove this because this was a practice. And so, instead of removing this, which would be strange to what they have known, the Emperor Constantine and other people and other politicians said, let us bring in the idols, let us make idols of St. Paul and you know, all the apostles. They put all the apostles, they put their images and build them into idols inside the church. And then they put Jesus Christ, they made a, an image of Jesus Christ to be at the altar. So that when you come in and you're bowing down to the image of Jesus or to the image of any of the apostles, you will not feel as if you're practicing paganism. But the Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And it went on to say, either in the likeness of anything on earth or in heaven. Because God knew that there will come a time when this will happen. And so he warned this early on and said, not, don't even make an image of me. He said, not in the likeness of anything on earth or anything in heaven or anything under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them and worship them. So, the early priests knew this law in the Ten Commandments and they said that we will not bow down to this. This is again, even if it is St. Paul, even if it is Jesus Christ, the Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image. A lot of things came up in the amalgamation, and there were many ways of celebrating these gods, but there was one special god that had the celebration of this god took several days at the end of the year. And the last day of celebration of this god ended on the 25th day of the 12 months of every year. This God was known as Saturn. Saturn had this celebration that is known as Saturnalia. Saturnalia is a series of festivals done to hell Saturn. Saturn is the God of fertility. The God of fertility is something that it's like he had the power. If he told the woman that they would not bear a child, then that woman would not bear a child. So they had to worship Saturn in a very special way to make sure that their women continue to bear children. In the celebration of Saturnalia, there were many days that were devoted to the celebration of Saturnalia. During these days, all the slaves were freed in the, in the pagan religion. During these days, the slaves were freed to be able to have sexual satisfactions with their masters because during those days, they were no longer slaves. During these days, sexual satisfaction was really highly esteemed and you could have sex with anybody you want despite whatever because you are worshipping the God of fertility. Now, the person that gave birth, the mother of the god of fertility, the mother of Saturn, her name was Adonis. Adonis was believed to have died, but then changed and grew up as a tree. And having grown up as a tree that never dies, she was being signified as a green tree. My people. Whenever you carry a Christmas tree, you are actually immortalizing Adonis. 
because a Christmas tree remem reminds you of Adonis. We don't all know this, and that is why I've chosen to remind us actually what is being celebrated. And I will go back to my real message today, which is the true spirit of Christmas. So, Adonis died, but it was believed that she came back to life as a tree. And she came back to life as a tree, as a green tree that never dies. That is why the green tree is being celebrated today. Now, instead of hailing and worshipping Adonis as the tree, since we are now amalgamating paganism with Christianity, we decided to change the name for Adonis to what? Christmas tree. That is not the end of what happened. Now, I started with the Ujuju and Ototo. During those days, during the celebration, you know, when you're doing a big festival, you have to take into consideration children and every age. One of the days during Saturnalia was devoted to giving toys to children. In those days, many people who were carvers carved out toys of animals, carved out toys of babies, carved out toys of houses, different types of toys were carved out. And in one of the days during Saturnalia, that was the day for the Ototo to come and give toys to children who have been good to their parents. So, during the amalgamation of paganism with Christianity, they couldn't leave this vital aspect of Saturnalia. And so, since St. Nicholas was one of those that really stood against, remember this was happening 300 years later, after Jesus was born. Since St. Nicholas was one of those who was really against fighting this movement of paganism and uh, you know, infiltration into the Christian church, they decided to immortalize St. Nicholas and change that monster that punishes children and rewards them if they are good, and they, sent, they changed the name to St. Nicholas, which in that dialect is Santa Claus. Now, I hope we are seeing how the changes of each of those things were made. How did we come about the red and white color? It is a sign of fertility. The white stands for the sperm of the man, and the red stands for the menstrual period of the woman. Many people think that it's Coca-Cola that makes Santa Claus to have white and red color. Think again. Go and Google pagan origin of Christmas. You will discover the meaning of jingle bells. You will discover the meaning of reindeer. You will discover a lot of shocking things that you never knew about Christmas. Still on this amalgamation, it has taken years and taken years. And it looks, it looks like people were now forgetting Santa Claus and the real origin, and everybody was being changed to really celebrating Christmas. Everybody was now singing, Worship Christ the new born King. The devil now went into one company that has a soda in every country in the world, and that was Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola made a powerful reminder of Santa Claus. And when Coca-Cola made a powerful reminder of Santa Claus many years ago in his advertisement, people now came again and said, oh, Santa Claus, we are forgetting Santa Claus. And that rekindled Santa Claus and that brought back Santa Claus again to life because it looked like people were forgetting Santa Claus and now just hailing Jesus Christ on the 25th of December. While all these celebrations are going on, the Christmas trees, the gifts, and everything. Now, I want us to look at it again at how Santa Claus and his relationship with uh, what I just told you at the beginning, Ototo and Ojuju. There's a song that is being sung here. I know if I call my children, they will sing it. He said, you better watch out. You better watch out. Santa Claus is coming to town. Now, Santa Claus is being taught.
taught, and that has been the belief that Santa Claus is omnipresent. And that's why even in the song he says, He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. In other words, no matter what you're doing, instead of God watching you, Santa Claus is watching you throughout the year so that if you have been a bad kid on the 25th of December, Santa Claus will not give you a gift. So the omnipresent Santa Claus needs to push you to do good. You are not doing good because God said you should do good. You are doing good and you are scaring your children to remember that if they are not good, Santa Claus will not give them gift. This was brought in during Saturnalia and during the amalgamation of paganism with Christianity. They said, okay, how are we going to do this since we give gifts to the children? They said, okay, we are going to do it this way. We are going to change it from that monster. We are going to then him, name him Saint Nicholas. That way the church will not have a problem with it. We are going to give we are going to give children gifts. And it's not just children. We are going to let it be that Christmas, transformed from Saturnalia, is a time of gift giving. And so, when you're talking about the spirit of Christmas, people tell you that it's the time for giving. Very, very smart. Giving. That giving came from the toys that we are giving to children during Saturnalia. And since they want to immortalize it, now everybody receives Christmas gifts. Why am I telling you this story? Or why am I reminding those who already know this story? I am not telling you this story to stop celebrating Christmas. I'm telling you this story for two reasons. First, I want you to know a bit more about the origin of Christmas, just in case you've forgotten. Remember that it started as a pagan institution. Remember that when you are too much into the celebration of Christmas and all this, that you are actually promoting paganism. That is one. The second point, which is why I'm telling this story, is to draw you to the true meaning of Christmas. The true meaning of Christmas is found in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. As we are in this season of Christmas, as we are in this season of Christmas exchanging gifts, receiving gifts, getting chocolates, getting different things for our kids, receiving casts and everything, I want us not to forget what is really the true spirit of Christmas. The true spirit of Christmas, which God wants us to uphold, is exemplified in John chapter 15, verse 14. And Jesus said, You are my friends. If what? If you do what I command you. So, going back to our text, which was found in John chapter 3, verse 16, it is not enough to say, I believe in Jesus. He says that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's more than that. I want to draw you back to that word, believes. Because there are two types of beliefs. There is a philosophical belief, which is what the devil has. The devil knows that there is God. The devil, of course, he has lived in heaven. So he knows and he believes in 
God. But it is not a loving belief. It is a factual belief. It is a philosophical belief. Then I want to draw you to the second type of belief, which is a loving belief. A belief that you have in someone, in a God, that pushes you to live out a life of love to him. And the question is, like my daughter will always tell me how much she loved the Lord. The question is, if you really have a loving belief, what do you do? What you do is what Jesus answered and said in John chapter 15, verse 14, you are my friends. If you do what I command you, and I like the way the Bible does it. So if you make a mistake, you wanted to go to 15 verse 14, and you made a mistake and went to John chapter 14 verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So both John chapter 15 verse 14 and 14 verse 15 are saying the same. They say, yes, I know you believe in me, but do you have a loving belief? And if you do have a loving belief, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Brothers and sisters, on this day, the 27th day of December 2014, I want to bring your attention again to the true spirit of Christmas. The true spirit of Christmas is to appreciate God and the gift he has given us by sending Jesus Christ to come and be born on earth and live here and die for us. We cannot please God by celebrations because God is not just a God of rituals. We can only please God by upholding the true spirit of Christmas which is found in John chapter 14 verse 15 where he says, if you love me,